deal with this. Some things God has prepared. Some things that God has prepared. We could get me tonight on that subject and could spend a while, but uh, I'd rather not do that. So we're trying to get up and get down as we got this uh, fellowship here at the uh, gym building over here. And uh, and I want to don't want to keep you so late that you don't want to stay around for that. So, uh, but uh, thinking about what God has prepared. God, uh, He says over there in Luke chapter 14, uh, there as He gives us a picture of salvation there, the, the portrait is the setting of a table. And God has called to us, and, and it's a call to a feast. It's a call to a celebration. Come, for all things are now made ready. That simply means that God has made preparation for people to come to Him. And then He's made preparations for those who have come, and all are invited. Absolutely anyone can come, but in that passage it says that they all, with one accord, begin to make excuse. And as they begin to make excuse there, they, they begin to talk about why they couldn't come, really more to the point why they wouldn't come. And it was uh, when those who had been invited to come, made those excuses, failed to come, the other invitations were sent out. And here's what it says there. It says that servant came and he showed his Lord those things. And the master of the house was angry, it says. And uh, he said to his servant, I want you to go out quickly into the streets and lanes of the city and bring in hither the poor and the maimed and the halt and the blind. Now all that's a picture of salvation there. Are being called to this table and that's a picture of us. Uh, we are those that are seen as the poor, the maimed, the halt, and the blind. Amen. And, and the servant said, Lord, it is done as thou hast commanded. And then he says these words right here, we need to remember this. He says, yet there is room. Yeah, Even though we made it in by the grace of God being invited, and we weren't the first ones he invited, they made excuses as to why they wouldn't come. Uh, we got in and they began to make excuses. And once we were in, it says, yet there's room. And uh, it says, the Lord said to the servant, and this is what we need to remember, go out into the highways and hedges and compel them to come in that my house may be filled. Now the Lord, He's invited men to come to Him and He's invited men to partake of His finished work of grace there. And plainly, not all that are bidden ever come. And instead of these choices they can make to come, they, based on poor priorities, make choices to do other things there. And uh, they talk about why they can't come, rather, why they won't come. And as Christ came into the world, the Bible shows us that he came first to the house of Israel. That's who He was sent to. And uh, it says they would not. He offered, but they would not. He gave them His outstretched arm. And it says they refused. Now, that's why the Bible says uh, He was in the world. The world was made by Him. And the world knew Him not. He came unto His own. And His own received Him not. But as many as received Him. To them gave you power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on His name. Yeah. You know, I'm glad I got invited. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm glad, listen, that, that God had prepared this salvation for me there. And I've never regretted for having accepted and, and coming upon that invitation there. When He said, come, all things are now made ready. I came and I tasted. And I've seen the Lord is gracious. Yeah. Hey. And yet there is room. The words prepared. Prepared. In preparation. They're found many times in Scripture. The first occasion of the word prepared is over there in Genesis 24. It's in the setting of Abraham seeking to fetch that bride. He sent his servant there. He's seeking to fetch a bride for Isaac, his son. You know what that represents. It represents the ministry of the Spirit of God today as he forms the bride for Christ that will meet Jesus in the air. And it's in that context that the word prepared is first found in Scripture. The first time the word prepare shows up it's a little bit later over in Exodus chapter 15. Israel has crossed the Red Sea. I preached about that text last Sunday night there. As they go across there, Moses begins to sing, even prophesies. And here's what he said. He said, the Lord is my strength and my song. He has become my salvation. He's my God. I will prepare Him a habitation. My Father's God and I will exalt Him. What he was talking about there is he talks about a habitation for uh, God. He's looking ahead there prophesying of the tabernacle which God would design for them. And uh, that prophetically is a picture of New Testament salvation so that God could dwell with His people there and uh, become a habitation.
separation among them. Again, the context there is where we find the word prepare the first time. First reference to the word preparest is in Numbers chapter 15 verse 8. Speaking about the word offering there and the bullock that's being offered on that altar there, which he says now prepare it. And that bullock on that burnt offering shows Christ in his strength. He's our offering. And he came to do the will of God. He said this, sacrifice and offering thou wouldst not, but a body hast thou prepared me. God prepared that body so that he could come and do his will and bring about salvation. And then the word preparation. The first time it's found in the Bible is 1 Chronicles chapter 22, verse 5. David's getting older and it's in his heart to build the house of God and he's not going to be the one that gets to do it. Right. Instead, Solomon's going to be the one that's going to do it, but still it's in David's heart. The Lord commanded him that this was in your heart and it was good that it was in your heart, he said. And, and so what happens is David, the Bible says, he, he prepared himself, he prepared his heart, and he made preparation for the building of that of that temple. He didn't get to build it, but he made the preparation for the building of it there. And that's the first time the word preparation shows up in the Bible. And here's the point, whether it was talking about uh, the setting of Abraham's servant and Rebekah and the ministry there uh, of the Holy Spirit being shown to receive the bride, or, or whether it's the offering of the work offering, or it's the tabernacle that's being talked about, or the temple, the house of, the God, uh, house of God. In each setting there, the first time the word is found in Scripture there in its various forms, it's pointing to something there that God has prepared for us. And God would draw our attention to things that He's prepared for us. The first thing that I've mentioned today is found in Luke chapter 2, verse 25. It says there, Behold, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. And the same was a just man, or just and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel. And the Holy Ghost was upon him. And it was revealed unto him by the Holy Ghost that he should not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. And he came by the Spirit into the temple. And when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do uh, for him after the custom of the law, then took he him up in his arms and blessed God and said, Lord, now let us thou thy servant depart in peace according to thy word. For mine eyes have seen thy salvation, which thou hast prepared before the face of all people, a light to light the Gentiles, and the glory of thy people Israel. And Joseph and his mother marveled at those things which were spoken of him. I want you to notice there in verse 30 and 31, God has prepared salvation for the sinner. Amen. That's something God has prepared. We find in Scripture different ages listed uh, for the Lord Jesus there. He's first seen as a babe in a manger uh, over there as a newborn, and then he's also called the young child a little bit later. And then we continue to follow his life. We'll find him at 12 years old. And then when he begins his public ministry, the Bible says he was about 30. So he's a late 29 there. And as you follow the Passovers there in the course of, of his ministry, you find out there that he's, he's ministering and he's crucified. Uh, old, he's older than 33 years old. So, of course, uh, there's much more recorded of his life in those three and a half years ministry there that he, he works. But here in this passage, he's an infant. And uh, there's a man named Simeon who walks with God. And he's devout. And he comes and he exalts the babe of Jesus. And he gives him praise. And Simeon has been shown of God that he's going to see the salvation of God. And he's a faithful believer that's looking, it says, for the consolation of Israel. He wanted to see it. He wanted to see the Lord's Christ, it says. And the Spirit of God at that time led him to the temple. And as Joseph and Mary there were obedient to what the law had commanded there, uh, they took in the child Jesus as was expected of them. And this man Simeon takes up this child Jesus into his arms and he begins, it says, to bless God. And here's what it says. He said, Lord, now let us thy servant depart in peace according to thy word, for mine eyes have seen thy salvation. Now in the context, he's speaking of of the connection there that this consolation has to Israel as a nation and the Lord's Christ, Jesus, connected to Him are all those promises and all those covenants there that speak of God showing His strength uh, for Israel's sake. And even though Jerusalem, as we talked about this morning there, that city means the city of peace, they haven't known peace. And they're not going to know peace until the Prince of Peace arranges it there and brings about that salvation to them in their consolation. And their consolation is their Christ. Yeah. He's their king. Here's a man, 
sent him. He's lived under Roman oppression. He's lived under Roman rule there. And he knows about the suffering of Israel. He knows what Israel's about to go through there. And yet he still believes God about Israel's consolation. He hasn't given up on the promises God has made despite what he feels, despite what he's seen, despite what he's experienced, despite what he knows to be so. Yet he's still looking for God to keep his word. And he believes he's going to see Israel's salvation. God has showed him that. And one day, sure enough, the Spirit of God leads him to the temple. And there he is. That salvation is a person. It's the Lord Jesus, the babe. And the, he's the Lord's Christ. And he's that salvation that God has prepared. Now, I know doctrinally there's a difference between the salvation of Israel and the salvation of the sinner. I understand that much. Uh, but in both cases... The Lord's Christ, He's that salvation. <coughs> whether we're talking about Israel as a nation, or whether we're talking about ourselves as sinners, the Lord's Christ is that salvation that God's prepared. And uh, He's been made ready. <laughs> the salvation's made ready. It's been prepared. And the Apostle Paul is making this very point there in the book of Galatians. He says this. In Galatians 6.12, He says, As many as desire to make the fair show of the flesh... They constrain you to be circumcised only lest they should suffer persecution for the cross of Christ. What he's talking about there is in his ministry to that region, he had people there teaching the heresy that you've got to do some things to be saved, you've got to do some things to stay saved. And he's rebuking that heresy coming and going throughout the book of Galatians there, and he's showing that the reason why they're preaching this is because of the pressure. There's pressure. And we talked about that this morning there. The pressure is you've got to do something. And the pressure to keep the law. The pressure to become Jewish even. Uh, to convert and say that's the way to become a Christian is you have to be Jewish. And, and Paul begins to rebuke that idea there and show them there that they're, they're afraid of facing persecution. And uh, he's surrounded that all in the thought of the cross of Christ. And, and he says, For neither they themselves were circumcised, keep the law, but desire to have you circumcised, that they may glory in your flesh. Those who seek to avoid the offense of the cross results in their glory in the flesh. And that's the way it works. He said, God forbid that I should glory, save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, whom the world is crucified unto me and I unto the world. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision availeth anything, nor uncircumcision, but a new creature. He said, that's all that matters. Those that glory in the cross do not glory in the flesh. And those that glory in the flesh... Do not glory in the cross. The cross of Jesus Christ is an offense to the flesh. The flesh is an affront to the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And to profess faith in the cross of Jesus Christ is to admit the flesh is rotten and it can't save me. It needs to be saved. It's certainly not a savior. And there's no energy in my flesh. There's no effort in my flesh that can honestly be put forth, not in my best and most noble intentions even, will save my soul and bring about justification before God. Not in the flesh. Amen. Amen. If we're in the flesh, we cannot please God, the Bible says. Right. Right. Now this flesh can submit to water baptism. It can. And the flesh can go down and actually be baptized in water. And uh, yet that doesn't save. The flesh can discipline itself and obey the golden rule and, and go to church and become religious. But nothing the flesh can do can possibly bring about salvation for the soul. There's no salvation as far as the flesh is concerned uh, it producing anything on behalf of the goodness and the grace of God. It can't happen. Salvation for the sinner is something that God has prepared. And He's done so through Jesus Christ, His Son, who gave Himself on the cross. And to embrace the cross of Jesus is to admit this flesh is rotten. It's sinful. I, I need to be saved. I can't save myself. See, that's the offense of the cross. That's why when you preach the cross properly, you go against the grain of people. You cut their pride coming and going. Because you can't earn salvation. You're not going to be good enough to get it there. My flesh is sinful. It's rebellious. It's proud. It's stubborn. I needed the cross. I look to the cross. Why? Because Jesus, my Savior, in His flesh, bore the sins of my flesh. And it was nailed to Him there on the cross there. Therefore, I'm not going to glory in my flesh. I will glory in the cross of Jesus Christ. I've been baptized. I don't glory in that. I go to church. I won't glory in that. I, I want to treat, I want to seek to treat other people the way I want to be treated. I, I won't glory in that. 
I will glory the fact that the Son of God, the Holy Son of God, gave Himself on a cross that I might not go to heaven. Amen. And I would get to go to heaven. And I would have His Spirit abiding in me. And I would have a place at the table of God. And I'd be accepted in the beloved. I'll glory in Him. And I'll glory in what He's done for me. The Gospel is that Christ Jesus died for our sins. That He was buried. That He rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. And when we glory in the cross, we're embracing the truth of the Gospel itself. That's why Paul uses the terms interchangeably there. Uh, as he speaks in Romans chapter 1, he said, I'm not ashamed of the Gospel of Christ. It's the power of God and salvation. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, he says that the preaching of the cross is the power of God and salvation. And he uses the terms interchangeably there. And, and they should be. That part there that says, according to the Scriptures, the Gospel, Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, was raised again according to the Scriptures there. That's important. That means that we have every right to glory in the cross. We have every right to have that confidence in the cross of Jesus Christ. Why? Because it's not the teaching or the tradition of men. It's not the teaching or tradition of religion there. We can glory in the cross of Christ because it's the Word of God. And if God says, hey, it's according to the Scriptures, hey, we can bank on that. We can bank on what God says. The Bible says, let God be true. Every man a liar. We can bank on what God says. We can't bank on what men say. We can't bank on what religion teaches. Men may say anything. They can say something is. That, that doesn't mean anything. It might be. It might not be. Just because men say it is doesn't mean that's the way it is. Usually it means that's the way it ain't. <laughs> And religion can do the same there. A person can say it's this way or it's that way and you find out they're way off. And, and that happens a lot of time. Uh, but, uh, but according to the Scriptures, if it says it is, it is. And there's a couple of observations there that I've noticed there in the Scripture where the Holy Spirit says it is. Romans chapter 3 verse 10, it says, It is written. There's none righteous. No, not one. Folks, that's the way it is. It doesn't matter what anybody else says. Well, there's a little bit of good in all of us. A little bit of bad in the best of us. People just act like, you know, now that humanistic card is something there that they dug out of the Bible. That's not in the Bible. Jesus knew what was in men. He knew what was in man. They were sinful. Amen. Right. He didn't commit himself to man because he knew what was in man. All that, there's a little bit of good in all of us. The Bible says, it is written. There's none righteous. Amen. No, not one. Amen. Talk about the condemnation of the sinner, folks. That's a fact. Truth is, you're a sinner. You're a sinner. If you've never been to Jesus for the cleansing power, you need to be born again. You'll die in your sins and you'll go to hell without the Son of God. Another fact that's found in John 19, 30 there, the sacrifice, our Savior's making atonement for our sins, and He hung upon that cross, and that day He reported back to God the Father victoriously, and He said, It is finished. Amen. Folks, that's the way it is. God said it was, and that's the way it is there. And he, he wasn't speaking about his life. We know that. Three days later, he got up from the dead. It wasn't possible that death could hold him. He is the life. He said he had power to lay down his life. He had power to pick it up again. fact is, none of us would be alive without him saying so. And none of us will die without him saying so. Amen. He's the life. And the fact is, folks, that he wasn't talking about his life. He wasn't talking about his ministry. 2,000 years later, here we are, clear on the other side of the world. And we're still carrying out His ministry. Yeah, yeah. We're preaching faith in His name. We're telling people to, to repent toward God and show faith in Jesus Christ. That's our message. 2,000 years later, what He was talking about was there was a work to do. And the work there was to do was the work of salvation. You know what He did? He finished it. He finished that work. He said it's finished. And it's finished because the Bible says it is. And then I read there about those saints going across there in that storm in Matthew 14. Uh, traveling over some troubled waters and as they go through that time of testing the Bible talks about those contrary winds uh, Christ, uh, he shows up there and he testifies to him being the saint's companion and there Christ he doesn't leave us in the storm and thank God that he doesn't there it says there are those waters he came walking on the waters to them and he said it is I be not afraid and we can rest in the fact that when we're going through some contrary winds and some troubled waters that we have a companion with us we can know that because that's what he said. That's the way it is. <laughs> There's three things the Spirit of God uses that phrase. It is. Again, it's written. There's none righteous. Speaking of the sinner's condemnation. It is finished. Speaking of the substitution that counted in our behalf. And then it is I. Be not afraid. That's the saint's companion. And I can know there that the Lord's with me whenever I go through those times of trouble. Now the cross of Jesus 
glory in the cross. That's the way God prepared our salvation. It wasn't by church attendance. It wasn't by being good to each other. Going to church is something that we need to do. It's something we need to be faithful at. But it will not get you to heaven. Amen. Being good to each other, that's something God will recognize and God will bless. But it won't get you to heaven. The way God has prepared salvation for us is by the cross. Jesus Christ dying on the cross on our behalf by the grace of God tasting death for every man. And you think about glory in the cross. We talk about glory in the cross. I want you to understand if you're visiting with us today, I want you to know we're not talking about the symbol of the cross. We're not talking about making a sign over ourselves. We're talking about an event. 2,000 years ago, He was made to be sin for us who knew no sin. That we might be made the righteousness of God in Him. There at the cross of Calvary. And, and, and that's, that cross gives us several displays there. Uh, for one, there's the darkest exhibition of man's sin seen at the cross. You talk about a testimony to the sinfulness of all men. Yeah. There's several areas and institutions we can walk around in this country even, and we can see that testifies that all men are sinners. Places like a, an abortion clinic. Amen. Yeah. Uh, a funeral home. <laughs> Uh, a graveyard. Yep. Hospitals. <laughs> Amen. These places testify we're all sinners. Amen. We've all sinned and come short of the glory of God. And, and the fact is, though, that the greatest testament to the sinfulness of man wasn't just seen in those places. It's seen at the cross of Calvary when the only holy man and sinless man and righteous man who ever lived was mocked and cruelly entreated and crucified and cursed yeah. there upon the cross. Isaiah said, He is despised and rejected of men. A man of sorrow is acquainted with grief, and we hid as it were our faces from him. He's despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. He's doing this for us. But he said, Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. He was wounded for our transgressions, he was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. With his stripes were healed. That's him. All we, like sheep, have gone astray. We've turned everyone to his own way, and the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed, and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He's brought as a lamb to the slaughter, and the sheep before his shears is done, so he opened not his mouth. That's our Lord on the cross. Amen. By the grace of God, tasting death for every man, so that we might be saved. Fulfilling this preparation of God's salvation in our sin. The darkest exhibition of man's sins at Calvary is also the brightest display of God's love. The Bible says that this was manifested the love of God toward us because that God sent His own begotten Son into the world that we might live through Him. It says here in His love, not that we love God, but that He loved us and sent His Son to be the propitiation for our sins. Calvary was the greatest witness of Satan's defeat. Thank God for that. Hebrews chapter 2 verse 14 says, For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same, that through death he might destroy him that had power of death, that is the devil. That's what he accomplished when he died. He destroyed him that had the power of death. Amen. That's Calvary. He was also there at the cross of Jesus Christ where that mighty work of man's salvation was accomplished what God could do to bring man to Himself. And that's why He said, the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. And in us which are saved, it's the power of God. God prepared our salvation. He did so by the cross. Salvation is prepared by God. Secondly, satisfaction is prepared for the believer. Satisfaction has been prepared by God. Over there in Psalm 23, David said, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for His name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil, for Thou art with me. Man, that's good. <laughs> that's some good stuff, folks. Right there. To know, hey, I don't need anyone but Him. If I have no one else and I have Him, I have more than I need in this life. And David said, if I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I'll fear no evil, for Thou art with me. Thou rod and thy staff, they comfort me. He said, Thou preparest the table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil. My cup runneth over. Man, that's salvation. Yeah. You know what David said? David said, like we were seeing a minute ago, satisfied. 
I'm satisfied with Jesus. He was accounting the goodness of God shown to him as the Lord was his shepherd. He realized that there. In the way of salvation, God prepared for that for the sinner there through the suffering sacrifice. In the way of satisfaction, God prepared that for the saint by a living shepherd. He's good to us. Amen. It's good to have a Savior. Listen, we got more than a Savior. We have a shepherd. Amen. He didn't just save us, amen. He became our shepherd. The Bible says we are the sheep of His pasture. In that 23rd Psalm, it speaks of who the sheep exalts. Who do we exalt? Well, it says the Lord is my shepherd. The Lord, Jehovah. We exalt Him by name. He is my shepherd. The Lord, Jehovah, is my shepherd. And then we exalt Him by nature. The Lord is my shepherd. That's the way He cares for us. He's our shepherd. He leads us. He guides us. He protects us. And also in that 23rd Psalm, it speaks of what the sheep experiences there. First in the way of a personal relationship. Again, David said, the Lord is my shepherd. He's not just our shepherd. He's mine. Amen. I'm glad it's that way. <laughs> a personal relationship with the shepherd there. A precious relationship. He goes on to say, I shall not want. Folks, being saved. Listen, it's not just a matter of we're looking forward to heaven, although we need to be heavenly minded. Like Mr. Roloff said, we ought to enjoy the trip. <laughs> being a Christian, listen, it, is, it can be, it should be, a sweet life of contentment. Yeah, yeah. Where the peace of God rules in our hearts and minds. Yeah. Amen. That's the way it should be. Amen. God has afforded all that for us through the shed blood of Jesus Christ. We can have fellowship with the Lord. What else do we need? The Lord's my helper. He'll never leave me nor forsake me. The Bible tells us that we ought to be content with that. Amen. I think we ought to be content with the Lord. It's like no other, this life. The Christian life. A life of purpose. A life where there's life. Amen. I'll tell you, I've told you before, there. I, I've no sooner been saved and just the family and the situation I was in, I began to find some refuge in this Bible. And, and then I remember several times of the evening going out there and looking out. And, and Brother Allen's been coming over and did some work there on the patio. And we put up a gazebo and he planted a garden. Man, it's real nice. First time we had it out there, uh, Joshua said, Dad, you know what I'm going to do? He said, I'm going to sit out here with my computer. I'm going to read the Bible at 4 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> Now, I don't think he did that, but <laughs> that was his intention. It was just inspiring. You know, you want to get out there, be under the stars and all that. I remember as a kid just looking up and seeing that, and those, those perfect knots for me. It wasn't cloudless knots. It was those knots where the, the moon is out like it has been lately, and there's just been a few clouds coming over. And those stars out there, you can see it all. And I mean, to me, I remember being a boy thinking, boy, oh, I wish I could just get up on one of those clouds and just sit down and enjoy God. That was my desire. You know what, folks? I'm, I'm 44. The other night I said I was 45. I'm 44. I'm not 45 yet. I still have that desire. Get up there and snuggle up next to God. Just get away from it all. I remember sitting there thinking the other night out there on that patio, Brother Al, I was sitting there looking at that there, and I thought, God, I'd still like to get up there. I still like to sit down with you and just get away from it all and just be with you. It was like the Lord said, well, come on. <laughs> And I can't get up there. Obviously, I can't get up there, but I'll tell you what. I have a rock in the Lord. And there's a cleft in that rock. And I can get away from everything and everyone else. I can get away from myself in Him. Amen. Being saved is a sweet thing, folks. You really ought to enjoy it more than what you are. <laughs> Amen. Thank God for the Christian life. David said, my cup is running over. You're just looking at the goodness of God. He said, you prepare a table before me. Just to realize, I'm, I'm not worthy to sit at this table. Look what he put on it. Yeah. Now, we, we don't all get to go to the restaurants like we like. I'd say most of us don't get to. Some of us probably go more than we should. But ain't it good to sit down there, you know, you're drinking a pop or some water or whatever. I'm drinking a pop, you're drinking water. <laughs> and they keep coming by, just fill it up your drink. They're just waiting on you. It's almost like it's a humbling thing. I'll get it myself. You really don't know how to act. They keep running over there, filling up. Think there. You're sitting at the Lord's table. And He's giving you more than you can deal with. It's right there. It's just the goodness of God. He's keeping that cup running over. Hey. Hey. Folks, that's God. You know what He's prepared for us? He's prepared satisfaction for the believer. Yeah. Satisfied. I'm not satisfied with myself. I know I'm a mess. There's a lot of room for improvement. I always do better than I 
I'm doing. I can always do more than I'm doing. Sorry, the cut dog has to talk. I'm not satisfied with me. I am satisfied with Jesus. I'm satisfied with the Lord, and I am satisfied with His salvation. He's my high tower. He's my rock. He's my strength. He's the light of my life, and I'm just in love with Him. And that leads me to say God has prepared blessings for those of us that have been saved. There are blessings. There are spiritual blessings. Here's what it says in 1 Corinthians. I won't have to turn there because I need to wrap this up. But he says, I have not seen nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for them that love him. And I know a lot of times we think of that in reference to heaven, but the context isn't talking about heaven. I have not seen nor ear heard the things that God has prepared for them that love him, but God hath revealed them unto us by his Spirit. For the Spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. For what man knoweth the things of a man, save the Spirit of man which is in him? Even so the things of God knoweth no man, but the Spirit of God. Listen, now we receive, now have we received, not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God. We, we have no idea of all the things that God has prepared for us this side of eternity. The blessings of being saved. Spiritual blessings there. Salvation for the sinner, provided by a dying Savior. Satisfaction for the saint, provided by a living shepherd. And then the blessings for the spiritual, revealed to us by the Spirit of God. And then fourth, God has provided a place for the glorified. It says there in John chapter 14, Jesus said, Let not your heart be troubled. If you believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. He said, I go to prepare a place for you. <laughs> And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. He's prepared a place. He has prepared a place for us. We have a place in heaven for one. We have a place that's prepared for us for another. We have a place that's prepared for us by God, by the Lord Himself. What a thing. I doubt any of us in here got a hold of that. And I'm the one talking, and I didn't get all of them. Because that's the way it goes. Yeah. These things, man, I mean, the faith has to increase to even to get a hold of the good things God says we want. <laughs> the blessings of, of heaven and eternity. Here's what Hebrews 11, 16 says. Now they desire a better country that is in heaven. Wherefore, God's not ashamed to be called their God. For he hath prepared for them a city. Yeah. That's the better country, folks. Yeah. I'm looking forward to it. Uh, I, I would that we were on our way tonight. But the fact is, while we're here, we enjoy the trip. He's been good to us. He's made preparation for us. On the flip side of that, you're here without the Lord Jesus Christ. The Bible says one day you'll stand before Him and He'll say, Depart from me, be cursed, in the everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. Now imagine going into such a place that the Lord has prepared for Satan and his angels. And that be your home for all eternity. And you never get out. That's what Jesus says is going to happen. The Bible says, how can you escape the damnation of heaven? I wouldn't repeat such a question tonight to you if there was no escape. Thank God there is. Amen. God's prepared salvation for you. Amen. We have it. He set a table. He gave you a picture. He set a table and said, Come. All things are now made ready. If you'll come, he'll take you. Paul, made, blind, poor, it makes no difference to him. He said, Yet, there is room. Yeah. If you're not saved, tonight you can be saved. The Bible says, Neither is there salvation in any other. There is none other name under heaven. Give them all men. I yeah. must be saved. Will you come and receive Christ tonight? I want to ask you with your heads bowed and your eyes closed. Everyone pray. If there's someone here, you would raise your hand and say, Preacher, pray for me. I've never been saved. Please pray for me. Would you slip up your hand right now? I've never been saved. <coughs> Anyone say, I'm not sure. I'm really not sure. I want you to say, please. Father, bless you. I thank you, Lord, for your preparations you've made for us. And the Lord has encouraged us by reminding us of this thing. And I pray, Lord, tonight, if there's someone here that's never been saved, you know, they, they don't really know how to stand.
your situation.